Sometimes we act and behave in certain ways that we don't even know why we do what we do. Or there are bad things that as we get older, we become more inclined towards. Or we become more prone to. It's interesting that the older we get, the more we walk in life, the more vulnerable, the more prone and inclined to certain things that we never thought we would be inclined towards, we become inclined towards. And we go, I never thought that I would ever do this. I never thought that this would be a temptation. I never thought that this would be a decision or a choice that I would have to pick from. And we start wondering, how is it that I am more inclined to this? Or how is it that I am prone to this now when I wasn't before? It's almost like the things that we resented from our parents for are now the very things that we are inclined towards. That some of you have parents that you've resented for a long time because they've done certain things that have bothered you, that have offended you, or that have hurt you or your family. And it's interesting that the very things that we sometimes resent our parents from, or we resent our parents for, are the very things that we are now gravitating towards. It's crazy. It's mind boggling. It's supernatural. It's, it's unexplainable. It's mysterious. It's unexplained. That the very things that we grew up hating about our parents sometimes are the very things that we are now engaging in, participating with, mixing with, flirting with. And we go, how is it? How is this possible? And we say to ourselves, why am I so seduced by this thing? Why am I picking up and why am I overtaken by these things or these patterns? And it's because this is a spiritual problem that you cannot and you will not fix with your own power, your own will, or your own strength and efforts. This is something that you will need God to deliver and heal you from. Only God can deliver you and heal you from certain things that you are frustrated with, that you are surprised about, that you are wrestling with, that you are dealing with, that you know you shouldn't, but you end up doing it, that you know you don't want to, but you keep gravitating towards, that you know, you know that this hurts you, and not only you, but it hurts your children after you, yet knowing all these things, you're seduced by it. You're overtaken. And you're wondering why. And the problem is this. That you're not going to fix this with your willpower. You're not going to fix this with your own strength. You're not going to fix this with your own effort. You can't fix this with money. Because this is a spiritual problem. And the only one that can help you is God through his healing and his deliverance. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. This is not my fight. This is his fight. And I give him glory. Because he's a God that responds. He's a God that fights for you. On behalf of you. For you. With you. Hallelujah. Hey. And so the Bible calls these problems. The Bible calls these these problems that we can't win. You can't beat. You can't change. And you know you can't change because you've been trying to change. And you know you can't beat it because you haven't beat it yet. And you know that you can't win because it's winning. This is a spiritual problem. The Bible calls this Iniquities. 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 They are inward spiritual issues that flow out from within. They're inside of you. 
And the Bible has this other word called transgressions. Can you say it with me on three? One, two, three. Transgressions. Transgression is the outward act. And iniquities is the inward inclination. So the Bible calls a transgression the act, for example, if a husband or a wife cheats on her husband or cheats on her, on his wife, that was a transgression. The act of sleeping with another person that was not his or her spouse, that's called transgression. Transgression is the outward action. It's the problem that we do when we act on a sin and it's the action of our sin. So when a husband or a wife cheats on their spouse, they've transgressed. The iniquity, on the other hand, is the inward bent. The iniquity is the lust. The iniquity is the thoughts. The iniquity is the emotional affair before the physical affair took place. The iniquity is the premeditation of the act or the transgression. And for some of us, we're maybe not dealing with transgressions because you're not doing the thing you shouldn't, but you're dealing with right now, you're wrestling with right now, you may be fighting right now the iniquity. The inward bent towards a certain thing. And this is why Proverbs chapter 5, verse 22, you guys know Proverbs, business people should read this a lot. Okay, Proverbs says this, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him. The iniquities trap the person. And watch this. And he is held fast in the cords of his sin. Wow. Doesn't this sound like you? Doesn't this sound like us? Doesn't this sound like me sometimes? That we're trapped in an iniquity and there are cords of transgression that keep us down, that we can't get up. This verse is an exact explanation of the state of some of our lives in this room tonight. Oftentimes, these iniquities are amplified. Listen to what I'm going to tell you right now. Often, so the iniquity is the inward bent that you fight with. So the iniquity is the, 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 the thoughts. Oh man, uh, that, that, that guy just looks so good and man, I just want to feel those biceps and I just want to touch his buns of steel and I don't know what girls think and, and, for, and for guys, it's the same way. Guys, is oh, that girl, oh my, she looks so good. Mm, 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 she's Campbell's good. Mm, mm, mm. And you start thinking things and then you start imagining things that we will not talk about here in Crave Church but you can actually put an insert on fill in the blanks. You already know where your mind goes. That is an iniquity. An iniquity is also, oh, the money's there. No one's watching. The money's there. An iniquity is, oh man, I'm, I'm so, I, I, I really want to go to the casino. <clears throat> I really, really want to go gamble at the casino. Or the iniquity is, man, every time I'm at a party, I just can't stop looking at the alcohol. It's calling my name, the bourbon. It's just calling. And you just grab it. Why? Because there's an iniquity in you. It's an inward thing that even though you necessarily don't do anything on the outside, you have a bent towards it on the inside. And oftentimes, these iniquities, they're amplified. They're made bigger through something that happened to us in our childhood. The Bible says that we do not ignore the devil's schemes or the plans of the enemy of our soul. And one of those plans is that the enemy of our soul looks for children at a young age that he can damage and make a hole in their soul. The enemy is crazy for the generations. But the enemy of our souls that hates you so much because you bear the image of God, because the devil hates God, and because you bear the image of God, he hates you too. Yeah. And he hates the fact that you are forgiven and he's not. Yeah. That you are redeemed and he's not. That you are healed and he's not. That you have second chance, a third chance, and he does not. He hates you. He hates you. He hates you. And he hates that God has given you so much privilege. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. He hates you. And so one of the things 
that the enemy of our life, of our souls, does is that he looks for children at a young age to create an emotional hole. Creates an emotional hole in their soul through abuse, verbal abuse, through sexual abuse, through anger, through rejection, through abandonment, and so on. And all of these things cultivate these things, these holes, these moments that are so difficult in a child's life. They cultivate the ground of our heart for iniquities to harbor and be nourished. And so at a young age, the devil makes an emotional hole in a child's heart so that he can have an entry point as leverage to prey on the child's iniquities in that child's adult life. So the enemy of our soul sees that there's been a young girl that's been sexually abused and maybe you are that young girl in this room tonight. And he said, perfect. This is what will create an emotional hole in this young lady, in this young girl's soul. This hole gives me leverage to be able to pounce on this girl in her adult life. Or maybe there's a hole of rejection and abandonment in your life. That as you were a child, you felt abandoned, you felt rejected, you felt left, and you felt forsaken. And so the enemy of your soul goes, perfect, I'm going to drive that. I'm going to twist that knife, and I'm going to make a hole. And I'm going to use this hole in her soul, or his soul, as leverage. So that I could amplify the iniquities that have already been passed on. And this is how the enemy schemes against us in our adult life. And it's crazy how iniquities inevitably repeat in many families. It's crazy how iniquities repeat without you being able to stop it. It's supernatural how a mother will cheat on her husband and her daughter will grow up to do the same. It's crazy how a father will have an addiction problem, maybe to gambling, alcohol, or drugs, and his son will grow up to be the same. It's crazy how a mother has a spirit of rejection and the daughter ends up having the same behaviors and traits of rejection. It's crazy how a father will have a sexual immoral problem of lust and the son will have a sexual immoral problem of lust too. It's incredible how a mother will be controlling and manipulative and the daughter grows up to be the same. Have you seen the pattern? That you'll see a father lost in alcoholism and a few years later when that son grows up, he's in the same state. It's crazy. It's just, it's, it's incredible how it pans out. That no matter what we do, it just ends up happening. And it's because there's an iniquity that has been passed on that goes beyond your willpower. It goes beyond your imagination. It goes beyond your strength. It goes beyond your ability. It's like you just gravitate towards it. And the Bible actually teaches that these iniquities get passed on all the way to the fourth generation. Look what the Bible says in Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Say amen. That's good. Amen. Forgiving iniquity. and What's iniquity? The inward? Inclination. The inward? Inclination. Say it together on three. The inward? Inclination. And transgression is the outward? Yes. So God forgives both. Amen. That's powerful. Amen. That's good. Because yes. sometimes we go, oh, no, I didn't do anything. God's like, well, what did your heart do? And God's like, I'm willing to forgive what you didn't really do on the outside. But I'm also willing to forgive what you're thinking in the inside. Oh. That's powerful. That's good. Thank you, Lord. But he will by no means clear the guilty. So there has to be something that gets done because God will not call a guilty person free and innocent. He will not... He will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the who? Children. To the third and the fourth generation. And it's not that, 
this is Allah. And no matter how much we want to deny it, it's undeniable. Because you have family friends where you've seen this. You have family members that you've seen this. You have school friends that you've seen. Repeat the same patterns that the parents did. This means that iniquities are a spiritual, the, the, it, uh, the iniquities are spiritual sins that get passed on from generation to generations. This is something that goes beyond your intentions. This goes beyond your willpower. This goes beyond your education. This goes beyond your social status. This goes beyond your pay grade. This goes beyond your training. This goes beyond your physical health. This goes beyond your emotional health. This goes beyond your mental health this transcends all of that uh -huh. it's a spiritual law that you cannot escape and if you could you would have done it already right. and it feels like well how do I get rid of it because God won't call me innocent if, if, if I'm guilty yeah. God made a way God made a way for you God made a way and his name is Jesus Worthy is Jesus Christ of our praise. He's worthy of our claps. He's worthy of our shouts. See, you are not supposed to be innocent. And God would never call you innocent if you're guilty because the truth is we're all guilty and we're all sinners and we're all broken and we're all messed up and we all have issues and we all have patterns that we want to break that we cannot break. But God made a way. And I like how there's this guy called the Apostle Paul. He was a very true historical figure. Scholars do not deny him. They actually, actually agree, scholars at a scholar level agree that he influenced the culture of our Western civilization so much. Because this guy was such a powerful writer and he writes something so, so descriptive of how we sometimes may feel. And here's what he says in Romans chapter seven. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I am. Have you ever been in church? God's presence and his energy or what we call his spirit is moving and you're not moving? Yeah. And you're like, when's this going to finish? <laughs> I'm hungry. Paul was the same. God is spiritual, but sometimes I'm not. Isn't this also your experience, he says? Yes, I'm full of my self. And that's how we are sometimes. Man, I got better things to do than to worship a God and spend 30 minutes singing to a God that I can't see or hear. Yeah, we sometimes think like that. Yeah. Yet he's the God that actually holds all your atoms together so that you don't spill out like a blob of whatever, you biological goo. Yeah. He's so strong that he keeps all the planets in orbit. And even if some spin in one direction and others spin in others in the opposite direction, which just destroys well, never mind, but you know what I mean. He's so majestic in his design and intricate in his ability to engineer even the movements of the orbit of our planets. My God. How dare we not worship this God and bend our knees. We come all tired and all sleepy, yawning instead of worshiping, and we give him our crumbs. Yet he gave you his best, which was his only begotten son, so that if anyone shall believe in this son that he gave up, shall not perish, but have eternal life. How is it that we come to this place half awake? If you went to work half awake in some places, you'd get fired. I want to give God my best because I've understood that I'm not worthy of who he is. I don't deserve his freedom. I don't deserve his, I don't deserve him to fight my battles. God is good. God is good. And even if you're cool, God is still good to you, young man. <laughs> yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in since prison. And this is what it feels like sometimes, that we're imprisoned, not at a physical prison, but in a mental, spiritual prison that we can't get out. And you're like, I can't help myself. Mm -hmm. right. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act. Another. Doing things I absolutely Despise. Man, I don't like to be rude. Man, I don't like to be depressed. 
Man, I don't like to be disconnected from my loved ones. Man, I don't like being lustful. Man, I don't like being disengaged. Man, I don't like being apathetic, but I am. This is Paul's experience. That the things that he did not like, he was. Sounds like us. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. It becomes obvious that you need just God. You need God. Every time that you try to do what you need to do and you don't do what you need to do, because you can't do what you should do and you're not doing what you shouldn't be doing, it's so clear that you need God. When I try to fix myself and I can't fix myself and I end up doing the things that I don't want to do, it's so clear that I need God. When I keep slipping into the things that I thought I would not be slipping into and I can't help myself and I just fall and slip into that one thing, it's so clear that I need God. When you keep catching yourself watching the things that you should not be watching and you said, I wouldn't watch this thing, but now you're watching the thing, it's so clear that you need and you keep catching yourself drinking the drink that you said that you wouldn't end up drinking, but now you're drinking it, and it's not only your first drink, it's your fifth drink. It's so clear that I need. It's clear that God's command is necessary. Verses 17 to 20. But I need something more. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, which is, you know, doing the right thing, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I need help. I need help. But isn't it interesting that for some of us, asking for help is the hardest thing and the last thing we'll ever do? And this is why we never get better. And this is why we never get helped. And this is why we never change. And this is why we never improve. And then our iPhone got seven iOS updates, but you haven't even had one? Oh, man. And it's simply because you won't click the help option. Now, but Paul is writing something that is so true. And he's saying, hey, the truth of the matter is this. You need help. Because you can't help yourself. I realize that I don't have what it takes. Some of us have not realized that we do not have what it takes. We have not realized it. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in... How many times have you decided not to do it, and then after you did it, you'll go just one more time? <clears throat> just one more day. <clears throat> just one more week. <clears throat> Just one more season. Just one more drink. Just one more phone call. Just one more text. Can I get a text back? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Just one more meetup. Just, just for closure. Your decisions result in no actions. Something has gone wrong. Say this with me. Deep within me. And it gets the better of me every time. Wow. He's talking about an inward problem. Yeah. He's talking about an iniquity. He's talking about a thing that your education can't fix. He's talking about a thing that your money can't fix. He's talking about a thing that no matter how strong-willed you are, like maybe you were really big when you grew up, kind of like me, and then you lost a lot of weight, kind of like me. Yeah, you have good, great, great willpower. You did it. You lost 20 pounds, 50 pounds. Great willpower. But guess what? This iniquity thing doesn't leave with willpower. Wow. It does not leave with discipline. So true. The only way that it could leave your life is if God sets you free and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Give him your praise. Give him your shouts. Give him your worship. Give him your standing ovation. Give him your Shouts, give him your heart. Hey! (laughs) 
And then he writes and he says, it happens so regularly that it's predictable. <laughs> oh, I knew she would do it again. Oh, I knew that he would call back to her. I just knew it. I just knew it. It's so predictable that the people outside of your own within life know about you. Oh, I knew he was going to slip into that drink one more time. Oh, I just knew that she was going to end up sleeping with him anyways. I mean, she did with the past five. Wow. It's so predictable. Real talk, right? Yeah. Some of the parents in here are looking at me. They're like, this is how you talk. <laughs> this is how the world's running. <laughs> and God is not really uh, shocked by sin. He's seen our timeline. God has seen the present all the way to the future of how bad we are. This conversation doesn't shock God. As a matter of fact, God wants to get in the dirt because he wants to clean you from the dirt. But you can't get cleaned if you don't recognize that you need to get cleaned. Shout amen if you believe in me. Shout amen if you believe in Jesus. That's a better name, right? It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. Isn't that so true? The moment that you decide to get cleaned up, you get back into the dirt. The moment that you decide to say no, you start going yes. The moment that you decide to distance yourself is the moment that everybody starts showing up. The moment that you decide to put your cell phone down to pray a little bit is the moment that it starts ringing the most. The moment that you want to leave your bad friends, your bad circle friends, because they're bad friends and they're a bad influence over your life, is the moment that they start inviting you to all the parties. Isn't it crazy? The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's command, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. I'm going to be honest. I love God, but not all of me does. Don't look at me like I'm such a devil, okay? Because we're not angels in this room. You're still flesh too. You're human. Your problems and issues too, just like I do. Because I'm sure that not all of you loves God Mm -hmm. or wants him. Mm -hmm. Paul had the same problem. Mm -hmm. So you're not in bad company. Not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, these desires take charge. Mm -hmm. Anybody can relate? Turn to your neighbor and be like, do you relate? Be like, because I relate. Just say it to me, would you relate? Because I relate. (laughs) All right, now watch this. I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. Oh my, I've tried everything and nothing helps. I've gone to counseling. I got therapy sessions done. I spoke to my friends about it. I put passwords on my laptop and my cell phone. I did a whole bunch of great things and exercises to discipline myself and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Wow, this is deep. This is so you. Yeah, it's real. This is so me. This is so us. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Hey! There is hope! There's hope! Hey, you got an opportunity! You have a shot! You can still do it! He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all of my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. This is our life. We want to serve God. We want to get close to God, but then something pulls us away. It's a law. And then I like what the next chapter says. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Thank God.
What the enemy takes for evil, he turns it for good. Amen. You guys remember iniquities? Yes. Inward, transgressions, outward. Yeah. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 53. But he, who's he? Jesus. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Where does a wound appear? Outside. Great. And he was bruised for our iniquities. Look at the parallels, how God is just so genius. How does a bruise happen? Does it happen on the outside or is it from within? within. All right, let's read it with context. But he was wounded for our transgressions on the outside and he was bruised for our iniquities. Thank the Lord for that. The punishment for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Hey. So I'm going to tell you. This is not just a pretty sermon that I want you to get pumped up. We have next steps for you, and we're getting ready for that. But before I get into the next steps, I want to tell you this. Don't feel stupid. Don't feel like a dumb person either. Don't feel like you're trash, and don't be frustrated with yourself. You're not the problem. The iniquities are. And you are not your iniquities. Come on. You are a son and a daughter of Jesus Christ, a king and a priest, and you are loved, and you are forgiven, and you're redeemed, and you're made clean with the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen to me. Do not identify yourself with your iniquities or your transgressions. Your identity is found in who Jesus Christ says that you are. You would never allow a thief to break in and then you get mad at everybody else or yourself. Get mad at the thief. Iniquity or iniquities are thieves that have broken into your home. That have been passed on from generation to generation. But in the name of Jesus, this year, this year is our year of deliverance. But you will be set free. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up very quickly, okay? I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to give you a smaller story. When God spoke to me about delivering me, he said, I'm going to deliver you for, from five things. Two out of the five things that he was going to deliver me or is going to deliver me from, two out of those five things, is insecurity. And I know that you would not expect me to be insecure or I don't even look insecure. But because of my past, there has been deep issues of insecurity that have been set in my heart that I can't control. And it actually controls me. And I feel like Romans chapter 7. So he told me he was going to heal me and deliver me from insecurity. And he said, I'm also going to deliver you and heal you from the need to control. As leaders or as CEOs or A-type people, we just really want to make sure that everything's running well. And believe me, I'm a person that really likes for this church to run well for you. I have this heart where I go, my goodness, our generation is so lost in perverted music. That when they go to a concert, they go, that was the best experience ever. They come to church, they're falling asleep. I hate that. So I want our volunteers and I want our teams and I want our leaders to provide the best experience possible for our generation. So when they come hear our music, they go, man, that was pretty good. That was relevant. And I go, heck yeah. And so we work really hard to make sure that we have something relevant, something fresh, something powerful. Because I believe that the church should not fall to the side skirts of culture, but That's instead right. should set the culture. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so because of that passion, there has been a hole inside my heart. And that is the need to control everything, make sure that everything's running well. Hmm. Well, let me give you two stories. One is this. That on my mom's side, my great-grandma practiced witchcraft. And she did it ignorantly because she wanted a means to make some finances in our country, we're very poor, third world country, Honduras, Central America. And so she would practice witchcraft, the occult. She would, you know, fortune tell and do a whole bunch of things. And by the way, if you go to fortune tellers, you don't need to go to fortune tellers to know your future. Right. You already have a God that holds your future in the palm of his hands. Say no to that garbage. Horoscopes, throw that in the garbage. That is not of God. Read his word, he actually doesn't like that. And if you have done that, you've opened the door to something that you do not want to welcome into your life, and that is darkness. So you need to repent from witchcraft if you've done that, if you've participated in horoscopes, palm reading, fortune telling, you need to repent from that. Amen. And at the end of this night, we're gonna repent from a whole bunch of things, and we're gonna reject vocally and verbally the things that sometimes bind us. Amen. And so my, gra my great-grandma, actually my grandma's in the house, she's right here, lift your hand up. That's my grandma right there. 
If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't even be here. Hey. So she used to practice witchcraft not just because she wanted to, she was an evil person, but she did it because it was a means to make money. So that opened the door in our generation. From my dad's side, same thing, my dad's right there too. He's right there in front of my grandma. Dad, put your hand up. Hey. My dad's side of the family, they practice witchcraft and they knew what they're doing. So from both sides of my family, witchcraft has been practiced. Witchcraft at its core is the need to control. You make potions to control. You make spells to control. You do rituals to control. You make incantations to control. And sometimes when we read our Bibles, Paul is talking about how the Christians should repent from witchcraft. And we're going, why should Christians repent from witchcraft? They're in church and he's talking to a group of people that already believe in Jesus Christ. Maybe some of them practiced real occultish witchcraft, but some of them were practicing witchcraft in a different form, which is the need to control. That witchcraft opened a door to an iniquity in our family where the need to control has been passed on and you can't, I can't help myself. I need deliverance. When I was about two to three years of age, my mom went to go drop off my dad to work at the Sky Train Station. It was snowing and it was cold. So she didn't want to wake me up. When she left, I woke up and I woke up to an empty house. No one was home. And I started panicking as a two Three year old. The station was literally like a three minute drive from the house. It was crazy how I woke up in those three minutes. In the span of those three minutes, my sister wasn't born yet. Incredible that when I woke up, I started panicking as a two year old and I sat at the stairs of my front door in fear. When my mom came in, just like literally two, three minutes after she just went up the hill, dropped them off, and came back. She found me in terror, crying as a two-year-old. And she tells me, ever since that day happened, something in the spiritual realm that the enemy saw, took advantage of, planted a hole in your heart of insecurity. So anytime I had to go to school, I had separation anxiety. There's this thing that just, insecurity, and even now that I'm a 30-year-old man, these insecurities have passed on to other things and they're insecurities at different levels. The same stories that I hold are this possibly the same stories that you may have, just at a different scale, maybe different elements. But we all have things that we need healing from. Amen. And you all have things that you need to cut so that they don't get passed on to your children. Oh, amen. amen. So I want to give you next steps. Are you ready? Yes. Number one, face it. If you want to get better and you want to get healed and you want to get delivered, you got to face it. Look at me for a few seconds. Some of us in this room have a problem accepting our mistakes and our weaknesses. You have a pride problem. If you want to get healed and you want to get delivered, you have to learn how to accept your wrongs. You have to learn how to accept your flaws. You can't play games with the spiritual rules in the spiritual realm. You can't play games. It is what it is, and you either play as it is, as it is, what it is, or you stay as you are. And the first thing that God will want you to do if you want to get healed and you want to get better and you want to get delivered is that you've got to face it, you've got to accept it, and you've got to acknowledge it. You gotta acknowledge that you have a problem. If you don't acknowledge that you have a problem, God can't heal you. And this is why God wants you to humble yourself. Number two, have faith. Have faith that God can heal you. Some of you go, God's not gonna heal me. I don't believe that he can. And you're right, he can't and he won't because you don't believe it. It's like people that say, I don't believe God speaks. Well, of course he doesn't speak if you don't believe it. Why would, why would he ever speak to you if you don't believe that he speaks? If you don't believe that he can heal you, he will not heal you. If you don't believe that he will not deliver you, he will not. And you're right, he won't. So the question is this, how sick and tired of you? 
How sick and tired are you of your iniquities? The only way that you can get healed is if you face it and recognize it and acknowledge it and if you have faith that God can heal you. And here's the third one. Submit and resist. Submit and resist. The Bible says this. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now go back to my list of three things. Here's the application that I want you to do. Because I'm not just going to leave you with a good word and a lot of information. I'm going to give you next steps. And it's up to you if you want to end with these things. Or if you want to cut these things from getting passed on. Starting in September, our city groups are going to start a program on healing and deliverance. How many months is it, Tina? It's about five to six months where you meet once a week and you go through this program with your city group. What is a city group? A city group is our small group system that we have in our church to create community and family. Because it's great to meet corporately here together at the church, but you can't really build intimate relationships when everybody's here that much. But if you meet with people at homes, you share a meal together, you have conversations that mean something, not just like keeping up with the Kardashians or something like that. If you have real conversations about soul, about spirit, about God, and not just makeup and nails and sports and cars, none of this is bad, but none of this is really beneficial. Then this is the place for you. If you want to get serious, if you want to get healed, if you want to get better. Starting in September, we're starting a program where we're going to go through some sessions once a week in our city groups so that we can walk towards our healing and our deliverance. If you're tired of your depression, you're tired of your suicide thoughts, your suicidal thoughts, you're tired of lust and porn and having sex before marriage, you're tired of all this garbage that leaves you empty at the end of the night, then you need a step to take. Because hearing truth is great, but hearing truth without application is nothing. So here's what I want you to do. After this experience, I want you to go sign up to your city group. We have different city groups with different age groups, different demographics, where you can sign up and partake with some people in our church in this freedom program, this freedom project that we have, and take a step towards your deliverance. It's good, it's good. Completely free, free of cost and charge. But it's priceless. We're gonna make a confession. God gave me a list of things that he wants to deliver you and me from. Some of the things on this list are a description of who you are. With your words and your confession, you're taking a step towards that deliverance and that freedom because your tongue holds the power of life and death. Isn't it true that a parent can destroy a child's life? By calling him or her stupid all the time? Yes. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Words can damage, they can destroy, or words can build. That's right. People that are very powerful in our generation have had great people speak into them. Yeah. So what I want you to do is this. Speak into yourself. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from shame, guilt, unworthiness, low self-esteem, rejection, and abandonment. Say amen. amen. Clap if you believe. Pop up the volume a little bit. Second one. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, suicide, discouragement, apathy, and mental illness. Say amen if you believe this for your life. Shout it. Amen. Next slide. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from insecurity, fear, worry, doubt, comparison, jealousy, and envy. Amen. Amen. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from pride, arrogance, 
anger, hatred, wrath, bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment. Say amen. Say amen. Say amen. Amen. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from ancestral curses, generational curses, generational sickness, and generational disease. Shout amen over your body because you believe in Jesus' name. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from witchcraft, the need to control, and the occult. Say amen. Here's the last one. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from alcohol addiction, smoking addiction, drug addiction, gambling addiction, sexual addiction, and every other addiction. Amen. Addictions are terrible. Now this last one is actually the one that I meant. This one is something that is attacking our generation. It's crippling and paralyzing our generation. Ready? Yes. Ready? Yes. One, two, three. I receive Jesus' deliverance and freedom from lust, sexual immorality, and sexual abuse. I receive that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Make a prayer with me. Here's a prayer. Ready? One, two, meanness. Three. Father in heaven, I pray for your deliverance, your freedom, and your healing over any of these areas and others not mentioned above. In Jesus' name, I profess that I believe in the healing power of Jesus and in faith. I open up my heart and my mind to your deliverance and your healing now. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray and we shout. Amen. Thank you for watching our weekly talk at Crave Church. A new sermon will be released every week, so make sure you subscribe and turn on your post notifications. With that, you'll be notified each time we upload a new sermon. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.